Have you ever taken a moment just to step back and consider the amazing magnificence of the construction and makeup of our planet, the diversity of life we see all around us? There are many different opinions on how it all started. The one thing we can all agree on is the magnificence and the splendor of all that we observe on our tiny little blue planet. So who are we really? How did we get here? Where did we come from? These are questions that mankind had struggled with for thousands of years and still have yet to come up with an adequate answer. Some believe that we may just be the product of a celestial giant bubble machine creating giant universes that just sprang into existence, while others believe that we just sprang from a point of energy that burst into an entire universe. Others believe that we are intentionally created by a divine creator. So what's the answer? And is there a way that we could possibly find out? We've never observed something come from nothing. Now think about this. The, the universe is something. <laughs> this world we live in is something. You and I are something. Now, science shows that this universe is finite. And what that means is that it had a beginning and it's gonna have an end. So, if something has never been observed coming from nothing, that means the universe came from something, right? The problem is that this very simple conclusion drawn from easily observable facts causes a great deal of trouble for some. If the universe is finite and we've never observed something come from nothing, 
This means the universe came from some other source. Think about it. If there was ever a time when there was nothing, there would still be nothing. So scientists have to explain why there is something instead of nothing, right? But then someone responded and said, we have observed at least one thing come from nothing. No, it wasn't something as complex as a dog, but it was what they call virtual photons in the famous Casimir effect or Casimir experiment. The famous Casimir effect, which was predicted by Casimir in 1948. Surprisingly, two conducting uncharged parallel plates attract each other in a vacuum. The reason is that there are always virtual photons. Photons are particles of light. There are virtual photons that come into and out of existence, even though no real photons may be present. Virtual photons cannot be directly observed, but they have consequences that can be observed. Because photons carry momentum, and because there are fewer photons between the plates, there's an imbalance of light pressure which produces a, an attractive force on the plates. This force is extremely small and was not accurately confirmed until a half a century after its prediction. So here's basically what the argument is saying in a nutshell. They're saying that it's at least possible that the universe sprang from nothing because we have observed something come from nothing and that's virtual photons in a quantum fluctuation. Before you go trusting in quantum fluctuations to save the day, there's a couple of things I'd like you to consider about quantum fluctuations. These virtual particles are governed by the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. It's just a fancy name for a simple law that says in part that a short-lived state cannot have a well-defined energy. And that just means that the law places a limit on the amount of time that a quantum fluctuation can exist. You see, the greater the energy of a fluctuation, the shorter the interval can be for the amount of time of that fluctuation. The calculations of the energy of our entire universe show that it's quite enormous. That would mean that if our entire universe were in fact the result of a quantum fluctuation, that that energy content would result in the existence of our universe for an incredibly small amount of time. Any universe created from a quantum fluctuation would almost instantaneously disappear. This means that it's very unlikely that our immense universe is the result of a quantum fluctuation. Another problem is that in order for a quantum fluctuation to occur, there must already exist space and time perimeters for it to fluctuate into. So you end up with a real chicken or egg problem here. So how could you have the perimeters needed for a quantum fluctuation of an entire universe to occur without having the entire universe already in existence to set up the perimeters for the quantum fluctuation to occur? So defenders of this argument really only have one reply, and that is that the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle requires the universe to have always existed in some state. This is where the theory that it always existed as a zero point of energy stems from. The problem then is that physicists will turn around and tell you that the universe is quantized, nothing smaller than a Planck can exist. Planck named after physicist Max Planck is the theoretically smallest point in which anything could possibly exist. If you look at a television screen, you know that that screen is made of, of thousands of tiny little pixels and that the smallest point that anything can exist on that screen is one pixel. You could think of the entire universe as being an enormous television screen and the smallest point in which anything could exist being only one pixel or plank. The problem is that if the horizon were only about four planks, then a wavelength of only about one plank could occur. That means that once you shrink the entire universe down to a zero point of energy, which is less than one plank, it's impossible for a quantum fluctuation 
to even occur. There's no pixels or space time within which a quantum fluctuation to occur. Consider for a second another popular theory to the origins of the universe, the multiverse or bubble theory. Born from the need to explain how our universe became so fine-tuned to support life, the theory suggests that there is actually an infinite number of universes. The theory is that if there were an infinite number of universes, then an infinite number of conditions could exist. This gives them the ability to claim that our conditions are perfect because we just happen to be in the one universe where the conditions turned out to be perfect to support life. This is an interesting notion and it's fun to explore. I mean, it makes for great movies. But if this is the backdrop to your favorite sci-fi TV show, then I'm sorry to burst your bubble. Quite literally. This is because when you really think about it, the word universe means all that exists. So that means that even if something else did exist, it wouldn't be another universe because it still is included in the definition for all that exists. It would therefore be only part of our one universe. Say hypothetically that an infinite number of universes could exist in which all possible conditions existed. Then this would logically require at least one universe to exist in which its parameters were that no other universes exist. But now you have a real problem because that one universe would logically cancel out the existence of any other universe. You can see how the theory fails just from that logical standpoint. Also consider the fact that we know mathematically nothing finite can exist infinitely. Then there couldn't logically be an infinite number of finite universes. Some would then argue, well perhaps the number of universes aren't infinite but rather that there's up to as many as a billion with billions of different conditions. But this doesn't solve the problem, it only pushes it under the rug. Imagine a grain of sand representing one universe. Now imagine all the sand in the Mojave Desert. And finally imagine a billion Mojave Deserts. That may sound like a lot of universes and it is. However, it's still only a finite number. It's still only enough to fill a billion Mojave Deserts and then it would run out. Followed all the way back, we would still have to explain what started the first grain of sand, or universe. The theory only pushes back the inevitable problem of still needing an infinite source to get it all started. The theory has no more scientific basis to support it than the latest Steven Spielberg movie. This pure science fiction. There's not one single observation it would lead us to conclude that there was anything beyond our known universe. So what does that tell us? It tells us we're still stuck with the same problem. The finite universe that we observe today had to have come from something else. It has to exist because of some other source. So if We've never observed something come from nothing, and that tells us something else. That tells us that that source that we observe has to be infinite. So if we know the universe is the result of some infinite external source, this of course begs the question, what? And more importantly, can we use science to answer that question? Well, not science in the same sense that we would use to examine the perimeters of a molecule, but the science that does apply here is the science of forensics. It's the same way that a police officer would examine the clues left behind at the scene of a crime by a criminal, we can examine the clues left behind by the source of the universe. What on earth would we look for to see what was responsible for the formation of the universe and of life? It may seem like an impossible task, but I think if we know which questions to ask and where to look, we can learn a great deal about the source of the universe. For example, the biggest question we would want to ask is, does this source of the universe 
Is it just some mindless cosmic force like in Star Wars? Or does it actually possess intelligence? To solve this riddle, all we have to do is turn to the other sciences and see how scientists already detect intelligence. For example, when an archaeologist uncovers an object, how does he determine whether it's just a naturally occurring object or an actual artifact? Typically, what an archaeologist does is he looks for recognizable design features, features that tell him that this object was designed for a very specific purpose. So let's look at a couple other sciences and see how scientists tell us that they detect intelligence. are social animals. They travel in groups. So can they plan together? So I've seen dolphins in the wild, and all of a sudden, all the dolphins get together and, like, and do a deep dive together. Obviously, somebody's coordinated that behavior. How do they do that? Are they actually communicating? It would help if we could just ask them. What are you saying? Now, they make different sounds. Yeah, French is very, yes, he's very vocal. Show me the difference between a click and a whistle. Here's his whistle. And these are his clicks. Scientists the think these clicks and whistles could be the building blocks of a language. But no one has yet figured out how to translate them. Yeah, you have a lot to talk about, don't you, mister? Stan and Terry have devised an amazing two-step experiment. It's designed to test whether dolphins are just trained performers or can they plan and come up with tricks of their own? Ronnie and Bill forward, Richie and Pyre from shallow to way back. First, the dolphins are asked to learn a concept, to create a trick of their own, not just a rote behavior. Now, Stan and Terry are upping the ante. They want to see if their two star dolphins, Ronnie and Bill, can create something together. This means the dolphins are going to have to think, plan, and hopefully communicate. So you're building them up now to the, to the right. big moment. OK, we're going to do create this time. Ready? Fingers up. Together, create. Underwater, Stan gets the dolphins' view of things. His camera is also recording any sounds the dolphins make. Sure enough, he hears their signature whistle. Go, go, go! Did you see that? They went on their backs and they lifted their tails. That's really cool. That's monumental. They've never done that before. It appears that these dolphins can do a lot more than just rote learning. What we're doing in SETI both in the radio here, which is what I work on, and also in the optical part of the spectrum, we're looking for techno signatures. We're looking for something that is engineered. We're looking for things that show up at a very small range of frequencies. Nature produces signals that cover a lot of the spectrum. So here in the radio, we're looking for frequency compression. In the optical, when we look for signals, we look for time compression. We look for bright flashes that last a billionth of a second or less. Um, that might be somebody's laser. So here's three different examples of scientists trying to detect intelligence. We have archaeologists looking for specific design features. Marine biologists looking for specific sound patterns. Even SETI Institute looking for specific narrowband radio signals coming from deep space. We notice the commonality between all three in order to detect intelligence? That would be specificity. Specificity, simply put, means anything that we observe that has a particular fitted use or purpose. And specificity literally becomes our intelligence detector. So here's a million dollar question. If we can use specificity to detect intelligence in those areas, why can't we use it to detect intelligence in the origins of the universe. That's what we're trying to detect here is intelligence. So 
the observer has to have that aha moment, you know, that, that moment where he recognizes that this object that he's looking at has an intended purpose. Just because we don't recognize specificity doesn't mean that specificity does not exist. It simply means we didn't recognize it. So that becomes the key point, I want to stress that, the key point to detecting intelligence. And, and that's what defines things of a specified nature from things of a complex nature. You can see complex things created naturally all the time in nature. But that doesn't mean that they were created by an intelligent source. It just means that the laws of physics cause them to come out with a complex pattern or cause them to come out um, looking complex. The key to specificity is to have that aha moment where you actually something clicks and you know that object had a purpose. That object was created for a specific goal. So because we've only observed things with specificity formed by an intelligent source, specificity literally becomes our intelligence detector. This means whenever we observe something formed for specific intent or purpose, aka specificity, we can be sure that it was formed by an intelligent source. At this point, this is where some people start getting nervous and jump ship on me because when they start seeing the ramifications of observing specificity where we wouldn't expect it in the universe, then it means they have to change their worldview. But someone wise once told me that you can't know the truth without first loving the truth. This of course means that you have to be willing to change your worldview if what you observe conflicts with what you believe to be true. And are the case of famous physicist and dedicated atheist, Fred Hoyle. One of the great triumphs of astrophysics in the second half of the 20th century was to figure out how the elements are made. Because the very early universe is very simple, it only makes very simple elements, like hydrogen and helium, the two simplest elements, and you can't really do very much with them, they have very boring chemistry. You need much more elements if you're going to have something as interesting as life, and in particular you need carbon. The chemistry of life is the chemistry of carbon. So where does carbon come from? There's only one place in the whole universe where carbon is made. It's made in the interior nuclear furnaces of the stars. Every atom of carbon in our bodies was once inside a star. We're people of stardust. Now, how that happened was figured out in Cambridge. Fred Hoyle, a senior colleague of mine, uh, was one of the leading figures in this. And they were trying to figure out how carbon was made. They had helium. And if they could make three heliums stick together, that would make carbon. But it's, they couldn't figure out how to do that. It, to get three small things like that to together at once, you can't do it. Okay, so we do it bit by bit, make two stick together, that makes beryllium, stays around a bit, another one comes along, makes carbon. But it doesn't work because beryllium is very, very unstable. It just disappears like that. So they were stuck. And then Fred had a good idea, and he said, um, it'll just go if there is something called a resonance, a very enhanced effect, uh, which is just at the right energy in carbon to make that extra one stick on much, much more quickly than you would have thought. So you're very pleased with yourself. We went off the nuclear data tables just to check that this resonance, this effect was there, and it wasn't. And uh, so he was, Fred was a very stubborn participant. He rang up some friends in the States and said, look, you missed something in carbon. There's a resonance there that you haven't spotted, but I know exactly where it is, so you had to have this energy. And they were probably a bit reluctant to look, but in the end they went and looked and they found it. That's a wonderful scientific story. But also it struck Fred that it's more than a scientific story. Because of course, if the laws of nuclear physics had been a tiny bit different, either there would be no resonance at all, or it would be some other energy which would be no good. And Fred, who had a lifelong commitment to atheism, is reported to have said in the Yorkshire accident, beyond my powers to imitate, the universe is a put-up job. In other words, this can't be just a happy accident. This is too significant for that. There must be something behind all this. Because Fred didn't like the word God, he says some capital I intelligence has monkeyed with the laws of the universe. 
Fred Hoyle went on to state in Engineering and Science magazine that a common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with physics as well as with chemistry and biology and that there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. The numbers one calculates from the facts seems to me so overwhelming as to put this conclusion beyond question. Most of the physics community today agrees that all the laws of physics are highly fine-tuned to allow for life. In an article called Laws and Environments, British astrophysicist George Ellis said, amazing fine-tuning occurs in all the laws that makes this complexity possible. Realization of the complexity of what is accomplished makes it very difficult, not to use the word miraculous, without taking a stand as to the ontological status of the word. Astrophysicist Paul Davis said the laws of physics seem to be the product of an exceedingly ingenious design. The universe must have a purpose. A prevailing view in physics today is that the balance of very technical concepts like electromagnetic forces, nuclear intensity, strength of gravity, mass of material, temperature, excitation of nuclei, and the rate of expanse all had to be fine-tuned somehow just to make the mathematical possibility of the formation of the universe even possible. The laws of physics are balanced on a razor's edge just for life to even exist. The cosmological constant, crucial to all popular theories on the development of our universe, must be inexplicably fine-tuned to the accuracy of one part in 10 to the 53rd power just for a life-permitting universe to exist. If the constant speed of light were altered slightly, it would change all the other constants enough to preclude life. Then consider how the centrifugal forces of all the planets have to be precisely balanced with their gravitational forces just to allow them to remain in orbit around the sun. Scientists tell us that even the other planets in our solar system are vital to life here on Earth. In 1994, Comet Shoemaker Levy 9 raced towards the inner solar system. They never got past Jupiter. Astronomers watched as Jupiter tore it to pieces and dragged its remains down to the planet's surface. They were the biggest explosions ever seen in our solar system. Had that comet hit us, it would have resurfaced the planet and it would have been the end of life as we know it. found an ancient clay tablet with strange characters washed up on the shore, you couldn't read it. Unless someone had cracked the code. But you'd still know the letters represented a language. 
even if you didn't know anything else about the author or his civilization. Language is recognizable, even if you can't read it. Take Morse code. It has three basic parts, dots, dashes, and spaces. These three simple parts are combined to represent letters. There are 26 letters in the English language, which are combined to form over 400,000 words. Those words can, of course, be combined into an infinite number of sequences or sentences. There is evidence that DNA represents a language. Four basic units, called nucleotides, combine into a code for 20 amino acids. From those few amino acids, the body forms more than 100,000 proteins. Even if you can't read DNA, it still has all the hallmarks of language. A language that biologists are just now beginning to crack. Every tiny cell in our body is packed with three feet of DNA, three billion nucleotides. The similarity between DNA and human language is uncanny. In addition to codes, both use similar techniques to pack, access, rearrange, copy, and translate information. DNA seems to represent a language, the language of life. DNA is not simply a computer programming language, but as you have already seen, there are some startling analogies between DNA and computer code. We can view each cell as a CPU, or a central processing unit, running its own kernel. As you probably know, in computing, the kernel is the main component of most computer operating systems. It's a bridge between applications and the actual data processing done at the hardware level. So each cell has a copy of the entire kernel. But amazingly, each cell chooses to activate only the relevant parts, which modules or which driver it loads, so to speak. If a cell needs to do something or call a function, it calls up the right piece of the genome and transcribes it into RNA. The RNA is then translated into a sequence of amino acids which together make up a protein for which the DNA coded. Now for the truly amazing part of the equation. This called up and coded protein is then tagged with a shipping address. This address is a marker consisting of several amino acids which tells the rest of the cell where this particular protein needs to be deployed. Once the protein arrives at its intended location, the delivery instruction is then stripped off and several post-processing steps are performed, activating the protein to now do its job. The protein is not activated until it arrives at its marked and intended location. the idea that the universe could have only be one of a multiple infinite number of universes but there's not a single observation that would lead one to such a conclusion and then there's the idea that the universe just sprang from nothing but there wasn't a single observation that would lead one to that conclusion either there's not anything that anyone has observed to lead us to conclude that these things happen Here's another example. You saw a moment ago how DNA resembles a highly specified language or code. However, a very popular view today is that this code formed itself through natural biological processes called random mutation and natural selection, aka evolution. So you think with such a popular view that there must be some good observable evidence to draw such a conclusion. What I'm about to say may come as a shock to some of you and maybe even cause you to tune me out. But all I ask is that since it came this far, would you at least hear me out for just a couple of minutes longer? 
When you boil them all down, there's really only two possible explanations for the origins of life. It either formed through natural processes or it was created by an intelligent source. If an intelligent source formed all life, he'd have done it so that all organisms could function well together in this one biosphere that we call Earth. It means that evidence for an intelligent designer would require two things. One would be that many of the different life forms possess similar features. Kind of like how all automobiles have round wheels and some sort of engine. Secondly, we would expect to see that key component to detecting intelligence, specificity. On the other hand, the two evidences we would expect for all life being the product of natural processes would be that all life forms, again, have similar features. Secondly, we would either expect to observe the process at work in the fossil record or in the laboratory. Notice here how both theories expect to observe similar features among the various life forms. Here's the thing you have to understand. Whenever two opposing views expect the same evidence, that evidence can no longer weigh in on the issue. It becomes polysemic evidence and must be thrown out. For example, in the famous Robert Blake murder trial where he was accused of murdering his wife, prosecutors claimed that gunshot residue on his hands and clothes was evidence of his guilt. They based it on the simple fact that whenever a gun is fired, it expends trace amounts of primer residue in all directions. However, the defense attorney argued that it's been proven that this type of residue can be transferred onto the hands and clothes by other innocent means, especially to gun owners by their own personal guns. Uh, so if somebody has those primer residues on their hands, they may have some questions to answer. Uh, it tells you four things. Basically, one would be uh, if a shooter fired a gun or if they were in the general vicinity of a gun being fired or if they picked up a gun that had recently been fired. And the last is it could be contamination from, say, if they had gotten in the back of a police car or something like that. Since Blake was a handgun owner, he would then be expected to have other logical explanations for the presence of gunshot residue on his hands and clothes and still be innocent. This rendered the gunshot residue evidence to be polysemic and useless in proving his innocence or guilt. Likewise, since both theories on the origins of life expect similarities between the various life forms, it renders that type of evidence, similarity evidence, as being useless in the argument. It's polysemic and must be thrown out. Other and stronger evidence is required. So in order to prove design, we would have to observe specificity, and in order to prove evolution, we would have to observe the process at work either in the fossil record or the lab. Here's a fact that may shock you. Out of all the evidence for evolution, there's not a single example of either. None. In the fossil record, there's not a single example of a finely graduated chain of fossils leading from one major form to another. You will find that all evolutionary arguments in the fossil record for evolution are based on similarity arguments. But again, I simply cannot stress this enough. Similarity arguments cannot be used to weigh in on the issue. Evolution theory says that random mutations occur during reproduction and then natural selection kicks in and selects those mutations which give the organism an advantage. It says that over millions of years, new and more advanced life forms emerge from this process. This, of course, would mean that there must be a whole lot of new information being added to the DNA code over time. In order to prove this from the fossil record, they would need to produce at least one example of a finely graduated chain of fossils between two major forms. And I can't overemphasize the phrase finely graduated here enough. This is because evolutionists often complain that when they do present chains of evidence that design proponents often just ask for more links between their links. However, this is only because what evolutionists often call a chain is not at all a finely graduated chain. They usually will present several different forms and link them together using basic similarity arguments. A true finely graduated chain would be one where there's no giant leaps between their links. 
For example, a dinosaur with no sail to suddenly a dinosaur with a huge sail. Evolutionists will often reply that finding such a chain would be an impossible task. My response is, well then you're agreeing with me that there's no fossil evidence for evolution. And did you know that all respectable paleontologists would agree to this fact? Darwin himself acknowledged the lack of transitional fossils in the rock strata. Darwin wrote, Intermediate links? Geology assuredly does not reveal any such finely graduated organic chain, and this perhaps is the most obvious and serious objection which can be urged against the theory. The key problem with Darwinism is finding hard physical evidence. Where would you look for that evidence? Well, obviously in the rocks, in the, the record of the rocks, the fossil record. Fossils have been collected for hundreds of years, for centuries. There are billions of fossils in every university and every museum in the world. But there are no intermediate species. You look at one strata and you find one kind of fossil. You look at the strata above it, you find a different kind of fossil. You don't find, what you don't find is a gradual change. Well, Again, I want to reiterate here that you don't have to have great wisdom and knowledge and be up on all the scientific journals about Australopithecus and Ambulosaurus and Tyrannosaurus rex. You don't have to have all these scientific names for fossils floating around your head and all this information crammed in your brain to be able to point out the simple flaw here. Since there's no finally graduated chain of fossils leading from one major form to another, that's really all you need to know. In the years and years that I've been challenging evolutionists to present me with even one, they've yet to be able to do so. This fact leaves them only one other place that they could point to for evidence of evolution. If we could actually observe new information that didn't previously exist being added to the genome of any multi-celled organism, which gives it a beneficial advantage, then that just actually might do it. It would at least show us that there's a process at work that makes the theory halfway feasible. Of course, it would require that we observed it under a controlled environment where we knew for certain that the genes didn't previously exist in some small minority of the population. I say that because evolutionists will often cite an organism's ability to adapt to various adverse environments. For example, a population of insects becoming immune to various insecticides. However, this isn't an example of new genetic information being formed. The gene, after closer examination, is discovered to have already existed in a small population in the organism and becomes predominant after their relatives are all killed off. A good example is how Hitler thought he was going to create a blonde-haired, blue-eyed master race. He thought by killing off all the brunettes and redheads and only blonde-headed, blue-eyed people there to mate, they would have blonde-headed, blue-eyed babies, that this would create a master race. From this example, we know that it didn't create a new blonde gene. It just made the already existing blonde genes become predominant in the population. At this point is when evolutionists often step up and say, wait a minute, we've observed gene increasing information happen in bacteria. The problem with using bacteria as evidence is they're a very unique organism with a special type of DNA called plasmids. And this type of DNA is unique to almost any other kind of organism on Earth. After closer studies were done, it was found that the changes that occur were the result of environmental changes, not random mutation and natural selection. It's almost as though they were designed this way, with the knowledge that they don't have the ability to migrate. And so they had to be given novel ways in which they could metabolize new food sources. So that's why we need examples from a multi-celled organism, which have never yet to be presented. As you can see, far from observing DNA formed naturally through unguided processes in the lab, what we do observe is quite the opposite. We observe that DNA is incredibly specified. 
it must have originated from an intelligent source. In fact, the only current reason one would possibly have to reject this conclusion isn't a scientifically based observation, but rather it's a personal discomfort for its ramifications. A truly honest examination of the evidence seems to scream undeniably the need for an intelligent source for all life. So the observable evidence shows that the universe and life must be the product of an infinite intelligent source. What does this all mean? It means the evidence that we observe cries out that there is a God.